Hello, my name is Greg Jansen. I'm a community development and programming librarian with the Niagara Falls Public Library. And I'd like to welcome you to our short live stream webinar, Self-Care and Coping Strategies with Dr. Sean Robb. Mental health and well-being was a topic of strong interest for our community even before COVID hit. And now, of course, it's become more important than ever. That's why we're very glad to be connecting you with Sean this evening. He's going to share a few strategies that can help you manage some of the many anxieties and stresses of life during COVID. Before we start, I'd like to say that the Chinatown people have called these lands where we are gathering home for thousands of years, and more recently, the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee have been sharing the land as one dish, one spoon territory. We would like to acknowledge the enduring resilience of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who call this territory home. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Robb. He is a registered psychotherapist and completed his PhD at Brock University investigating mental health in individuals living with traumatic brain injury. He works in both the public and private sector, providing care for individuals living with complex and persistent mental health challenges. Sean is an assistant clinical professor at the Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences. And now I will hand it over to Sean. Thank you so much, Greg. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening. I think it's a really important topic that I'm hoping we can kind of explore in, in much more detail. Um, so I'm just going to share my slides here. Um, so as we were talking about, um, the goal of today is really to talk a little bit about self-care and coping strategies. I'm hoping to give you uh, a bit more of kind of the neuroscience behind some of the strategies, sometimes really understanding why a strategy works, um, particularly from a brain perspective, can greatly help um, provide us the motivation and the rationale for, for doing some of these things. Um, so I have no conflicts of interest to report this evening for you. Um, I want to talk a little bit historically in psychology. Um, we have, as a field, have really very much focused on problems. And so much of the time we've looked at examining things like behaviors or experiences, things like anxiety and depression. We know that they occur on a continuum. All of us experience times of worry. All of us experience um, sad or alternative other experiences of emotion. Um, but the intensity of that has been really the focus around where an ex a person's experience of suffering comes from. And when these behaviors or emotions or thoughts um, become excessive or in intense, um, they often result in a lot of distress, um, disability, and in, in kind of increased risk for suffering and harm. So modern psychology has taken that perspective and said, Absolutely, we need to, to work on improving when, when experiences or behaviors um, intensify to a point where they, they really start to result in suffering or prevent us from doing the things that we want to do or we love to do. Um, those are incredibly important things we need to work on. Um, but there's also this capacity to move past just sort of feeling okay and feeling good enough in a sense. Um, the idea of, of what positive psychology has really brought to our field is this idea of flourishing and being able to go beyond just feeling okay. In terms of coping strategies that we can start to look at in terms of optimizing our well-being and moving closer towards flourishing and building ourselves up, um, Statistically, coping strategies can often fall into one of five categories. So um, things like a negative emotion to you know, move through a stressor so that the intensity of that emotion doesn't overwhelm us. And these can be positive approaches um, where we're trying to you know, engage in some behavior that might just lessen the intensity of that emotion, maybe slowing down um, kind of our breathing rate, um, would be a very positive approach to it. And other times it might be, you know, strategies that don't work necessarily in the long term would be things like having a couple of extra drinks or using a substance to kind of mitigate some of the intensity of emotion. Um, other types of coping strategies often fall into like problem solving and trying to take a step back from the problem um, and preventing it from emotionally kind of capturing us and then trying to figure out is this something that I can problem solve around? Is this 
emotion that I'm having telling me that there's a problem and can I work on that problem? And that really takes, you know, requires us to, to take that step back. Um, sometimes, you know, the use of avoidance is really helpful. Um, the idea of, you know, running, you know, seeing someone that you, you really just don't have the capacity to talk to right just right now, maybe having just a little bit of avoidance, scoot around the hallway, come back at another point when you're maybe feeling more emotionally and cognitively capable, um, that's a good use of avoidance. However, if we overuse things like avoidance, then challenges st tend to stack up and we, we feel increasingly overwhelmed. Things like distraction, like I can't solve this problem right now. I don't really have the resources or I don't know how to do it. Um, I, thinking about it is not necessarily going to solve the problem for me right now. So I might pull my attention off of it uh, and move it somewhere else and put my attention somewhere else to, to give me some a break from that stressor that's taking place. And then lastly, kind of this idea of social diversion, so the ability to kind of connect with a friend or family member, someone you think that is, is going to be helpful in either talking about the experiences that you're going through when you're stressed um, or being able to like have that individual help you think differently about it. Maybe they bring a different perspective to it. Maybe they think about it slightly different and that helps you feel better. And these five different types of coping um, that kind of we can fall through are the goal of trying to move towards this sort of hierarchy of needs where we want to move from just the base physiological needs the, of survival up to building safety, building love and belonging, self-esteem, and um, the eventual goal of self-actualization. Um, and we know from the research that if you have to pick some of those coping strategies, which ones could you put your focus in on? Um, and so the strategies that give you the most bang for your buck kind of thing are, are often focused around problem solving and task-oriented coping and social divergence. So being able to kind of take a step back when you're stressed and say like, okay, how do I solve this problem? How do I kind of take, you know, work through this and figure out is there a solution that can kind of, you know, move me forward or, or you know, break the problem down into to, to smaller pieces that we can start to work on and we can start to feel productive related to or connecting with friends and family and saying, hey, I'm having this difficulty. You have any thoughts about it? What do you What do you think about it? What would you do in this situation, or how would you feel about it? And getting some of that validation from other people um, that hey, this is a real problem, and you have the right to feel this way is incredibly important, incredibly helpful. Um, so being able to kind of navigate these coping strategies and knowing hey, none of these coping strategies are necessarily um, always good or always bad. It's really about learning how to combine them. And so my hope today is to give you a bit of a snapshot of um, some things to think about when you're trying to use some of these coping strategies. So one thing I want to point out, you know, from a very nervous system perspective is that sometimes um, we start to really experience emotion and we start to fear it or not want it to occur, try to push it away, try not to have it. Um, do anything we do can to not feel it. Um, and so it's important for us to remember the point of this part of the brain. So this part of the brain, which is called the limbic system, um, really serves as the fire alarm. It tells us when there's a problem. It tells us when things are good or when things are bad. Um, we know that there are at least six basic emotions. And I displayed here, happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, surprise. Um, each of them has an important purpose, um, an important guidance and motivation um, to help us know kind of what is the climate here? What, what are things like here? Is this a safe place or not? Is this a good place to be? What should I be thinking about? Um, it really is this wonderfully adaptive fire alarm that kind of guides us to it. However, if the fire alarm is always going off, um, and there's not much you can do about the fire, then we start to work on trying to turn the fire alarm off and not work on the fire. Um, and so that's something that really is about trying to build a relationship with emotion. And some of the best copers from, from what we've learned in the research is people who are comfortable experiencing emotion and are not attempting to try to dissipate it or get rid of it. They're trying to utilize it, make use of it in an adaptive and helpful fashion. And so 
one thing that we always encourage in our work with anybody is to try to build a relationship back with emotions. And that's particularly hard uh, for many who have lived through experiences of trauma um, or have experienced emotions intensely and, and just want to get that fire alarm to kind of settle down a little bit. And that's, that's very understandable, but building that relationship with the fire alarm is key to moving forward. The other thing that's really important for us to start to notice is that thoughts contribute to the maintenance of emotional experience. So the thing to know about emotions is that they are you know, meant to be short term. The fire alarm is not meant to go on forever. It is only meant to alert you to the challenge. And so putting this forward here of, you know, we've all been in those situations where somebody has, you know, driven in front of us and cut us off and we're feeling anger, feeling a lot of intense frustration. Um, and how, how is it that we can have this emotion um, maintained for, you know, minutes to hours to days if we actually wanted to? Um, how does that happen if here you are, Sean, saying that emotion, the limbic system, the part of the brain that does emotion is really only supposed to be able to give us this emotion for short periods of time. Emotion um, is, is meant to be sort of short-lived and that is through the maintenance of thought. So if you notice carefully, if you're that person who's experienced the, being cut off by another person, um, you have to keep thinking about the situation. And not only do you have to keep thinking about it, you have to keep changing some of the thoughts. So it's kind of making note of how this person didn't use their blinker, they just cut us off, and how could they do that? It's very inconsiderate. And playing through a series of different thoughts over and over and over again in thoughts maintain the anger or maintain the frustration, those emotions. And so it's important that when you're trying to disrupt, if you want an emotion to begin to dissipate and be less consistently maintained, um, it is about interrupting some of the thoughts that correspond to it. And thoughts become a, a way that emotions are maintained. And the opposite, interestingly enough, is also true. So emotions tell the nervous system which thoughts are important. So this emotional system uh, made up of many different structures within the nervous system, uh, particularly when it relates to this kind of funny sounding system called the amygdala, gives us some guidance. It's, it is, you know, if there's any place in the brain where the fire alarm is likely located, it is likely within this system. Um, and so the amygdala kind of tells us like, hey, this, this is important. It's usually related to negative emotion. Um, so it's kind of alerting us to danger and it's trying to keep us safe. That's its entire goal, it's built around safety. And so emotions tell us, you know, what thoughts are important. So the difference between the thought of a chair versus a bear um, is going to elicit a significant uh, different amount of emotion and so if you want a thought to happen more often so if you want to remember something for example making it emotional and making it meaningful definitely brings it back more often for people so they're able to remember it they're able to kind of bring that memory back up more readily um, it's going to come back into their consciousness more often so if i want to remember you know chairs maybe i can connect them to something emotional Whereas, you know, something that's very benign is much harder to remember. Um, so being able to do that and know that that relationship exists is really quite important. And so if you want a thought to increase in frequency, then make it emotional. And if you want a thought to decrease in frequency, and that's often what people are looking for. They, you know, when they have a thought, they're like, I don't want to have that thought anymore. It's a, it's a bad thought. And unfortunately, the process of labeling thoughts and telling the system that, hey, this is bad, this is not good, is adding this emotional tag to thoughts in a way that says to the brain, hey, this is important, bring it back, right? And so learning to kind of manipulate the system and make it work for you rather than against you, um, if you want a thought to increase, make it more emotional. If you want a thought to decrease, then it's increasing your ability to be non-reactive. And so taking any thought, even the worst thoughts that you can possibly think about, um, and learning how to become non-reactive, non-judgmental of those thoughts makes them disappear on you. It makes them come back less and less often. And the more you do it, every time that you have a thought, you don't react to that thought, 
Uh, emotionally, you'll see that the, the frequency of that thought will dissipate with time, which is an impressive skill set to have in your back pocket. One thing to keep in mind in relation to this is that many of us, as you, you may have heard, are kind of wandering through life, going through the motions in this automatic pilot, um, feeling like we don't have a lot of awareness for the present moment, right? And what we have a good sense of now is that when you're in that kind of automatic pilot, doing a lot of kind of multitasking and a lot of thinking about a whole bunch of things at once, a lot of distressing thoughts and emotions tend to occur on this. Um, and what's interesting is that we, you know, the research has spent a lot of time trying to understand um, these experiences. We have some incredibly new technology that really gives us an insight into how the brain works um, in the context of what's called functional neuroimaging. So basically we can scan the brain and look at what parts are doing what things, what are, what, what kind of systems are doing different things and how do they work? Um, and it's given us this incredible insight into this idea of what's called the default mode network. So what this means is that essentially, you know, the brain switches between different networks depending on what it's doing. And basically a network is made up of many different structures in the brain. And one of these networks seems to be about just sitting there doing nothing at all, right? So just sitting there, not intentionally trying to do anything and just letting your brain idle as if it was a car. Um, and many people find that when they do this, this is when times of distressing thought, distressing emotion um, intrudes on their consciousness and they'll have these intrusive thoughts where they tend to think about things that make them worry or things that stress them out. Um, whereas if they're busy and doing things, um, they're engaging in another different brain network called the attentional network. Um, you're paying attention and doing the active in something. If you're entirely focused on attention, then you're not paying attention to say those worry thoughts or those distressing thoughts. And so being able to learn how to switch from the default mode um, to other systems, those are, are to the attentional networks, that is an incredibly important skill set to have. And, and what we've learned is that people who are able to kind of switch into that attentional network um, more readily and really fill their mind up um, have a lot less intense negative thoughts and emotions. And then learning how to have those thoughts be non-judgmental to them and they dissipate. So having this ability to switch those networks is a fundamental skill that seems to be very much linked to well-being and satisfaction and flourishing, being productive, um, feeling productive and feeling completely present in the moment. So being able to think about them in terms of the context, often when we're thinking about you know, where are your thoughts and paying attention to this autopilot and noticing, are you focused on the present moment? Are you focused on the past? Um, and many of us are thinking often about the past. Um, and, the, you know, remembering the past is a helpful, useful skill. But if you're spending most of your time there, then you're missing out on what's currently occurring. Um, and so these could be things like, you know, I forgot about something, regret, earlier arguments, anything from the past that happens, and then reliving it. And the experience of trauma, of course, is the ultimate experience of reliving the past to the point where a memory feels like re-experiencing. Um, and that's, con you know, it conversely related to the idea of thinking about the future. And so a lot of experiences about anxiety, for example, um, are about thinking about the future, worrying about the future, feeling like something bad is going to happen in the future, right? And it could be, you know, things like dinner plans, which may be quite pleasant, or to-do lists, or it might be something like, what if I'm going to get mugged tonight? Something that really quite worrisome to me. And this is, you know, ideally that we can spend some much of our time in the present moment, you know, and noticing where are my thoughts and what thoughts lead to optimal coping and feeling um, the greatest amount of life satisfaction, feeling either contentment or working towards happiness um, as, as major goals. And so what we know about training the nervous system um, is that 
you can build these skill sets. So attention training, and this can occur in many different forms. Uh, mindfulness is perhaps one of the most commonly reported and most you know, studied, but any form of meditation that is about learning how to maneuver your attention. So being able to you know, take your attention off of something that maybe is distressing or negative and pull your attention onto something that's either neutral or even positive. For example, I work with many individuals living with chronic pain. And the challenge with chronic pain is that our bodies and our brains are built to focus on the pain because we're supposed to be able to do something about it and you know, attend to it or rest or try to recover. Um, and the challenge is what if your experience of pain is not, not going away? It doesn't dissipate, it continuous. Then unfortunately you're forced to focus on it um, and learning how to pull your attention off of it and engage in other aspects of the world outside of your pain is part of the treatments that are often related to chronic pain treatment. Um, so being able to maneuver your attention and switch from outside of the default mode network into the attentional network um, takes practice. And it takes us saying, like, I'm going to move my attention over while I'm doing the dishes or while I'm driving my car or while I'm having something to eat, paying attention to the present moment um, and paying attention to what I'm doing and soaking up my entire attention, focusing on the details of these aspects. And there's less room for intrusion at that point, right? And practicing it, bringing it back repeatedly and then learning with time. And this is the harder part of much of any type of attention training is learning to, to not get captured by those distractions or those distressing experiences, whether it be emotions or thoughts, memories, um, building this non-reactivity, non-judgment, and kind of this openness to the idea of like, well, it's going to happen. And of course it's going to happen, but can you build some of that um, real act, that kind of approach of coming back and the process of coming back has been well established to be like training your brain like a muscle between the front part of the brain and the back part of the brain. Um, this is where we think part of the attentional networks exist. Every time you pull your attention back, you're training that system as if you're, you know, lifting a dumbbell working out. Right, so it's incredible what you can do with practicing on it. And so building this up becomes very much about, you know, building up some of this wellness and coping approaches and being able to utilize this and allowing you to step back and use some of your problem solving to be able to think clearly that you can, you can actually work on the problem or, or chat with a friend, phone a friend, recruit someone who's in your life to also help you think about it differently. And often we're so captured by the emotional experience of something that it's hard to do this. And these strategies are about being able to do that more reliably. And what we know about this in the research, and there's just several papers on this that I've put up here, but there's literally hundreds of them. We know that this, this capacity to maneuver attention um, really is predictive of positive life satisfaction. Um, these are things that can very much help in improving one's own well-being, even when we're in some of the most distressing experiences that we have. Um, and this is very much relevant to the types of experiences that people have had to endure during COVID. So social isolation, dealing with lots and lots of additional stressors they didn't otherwise have to go through. So when seeking support, um, if you are interested in seeing support, and I would greatly encourage you to do so, if, if you have any interest, it really is relevant to anyone um, who wants to kind of optimize some of their coping skills. Um, working with a clinician with expertise in psychotherapy, um, there are many different types of clinicians, psychologists, psychotherapists, physicians, social workers, nurses, and OTs. Um, and the key thing to look for, and I've had many clients come to me saying, you know, Sean, I, I tried psychotherapy, I tried approaches, and they didn't, didn't really work for me. I don't think it's ever going to work for me. Um, and I would really encourage you to look for two things. One, you need to find someone you actually like to work with. You need to find someone that you connect with, that speaks your language, that does things in ways that fit you. And if that's not the right person, then it's probably not going to work. And that's the thing is the research tells us that the relationship between the clinician and the client is one of the best predictors of success. 
and then finding the right approach. So each person has kind of different ways of thinking. And so finding which approach do you think is going to work for you and having that discussion with any clinician about, you know, what kinds of approaches are out there? Can we talk about different ones and then make a decision together about what's going to be helpful? I also want to encourage people if they need any support at any time, um, COAST or the Crisis Outreach and Support Team for Niagara is available and their number I've posted here, um, as well as if you have any questions about getting access to either publicly or privately funded um, sort of resources in mental health, I would greatly encourage you to access the access line it is this one stop shop approach to being able to really get a sense of what resources are out there. And you can talk with someone about what's going on for you and then trying to match yourself up with some resources uh, within the community. So I think both of these services, uh, both publicly funded, wonderful sources of information. So don't hesitate to reach out to them if you ever need them. I think that's where I'll stop for, for today here. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you this evening. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I'd like to thank you for your uh, generosity and sharing your time and expertise with our community this evening. Um, for everyone watching and listening, I'd really like to thank you for joining us. Uh, for more mental health programs uh, coming in October, November, I'd encourage you to check out our website, my.nflibrary.ca. And uh, for now, take care, stay safe, and please uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks.